to another edition of The Business of OTT. I'm Chris Linden, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer here at Active Video. Today, I'm joined with Martin Gibson, who is the Vice President of Device Ecosystems. Welcome, Martin. Hi, Chris. Good to be here. So, Martin, before you joined Active Video, you led teams both at major middleware software providers as well as at one of the largest OTT content publishers in the world. What were some of the challenges that you saw your company's facing in terms of trying to get OTT apps delivered to set-top boxes in the operator community? So I've worked on both sides of the fence and I've seen from, you know, firsthand from the perspective of the integrator, what it takes to put this into a system. And I've also looked at from the other side as the definer of, 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 the, of the application, what it takes to get it onto a system. And there's a fairly well-known set of problems. The technology is common. We, most people understand how streaming works, but the challenges are fairly uniform. There's the challenge of the device itself. The device has limited resources. Most of the operators are concerned with keeping their bomb costs down. So they want these devices to be as little memory needed to solve the problem, as little persistent storage needed to solve the problem, et cetera they have infrequent update cycles. So the integrations have to coincide with the update cycles with the willingness to update. We can't push things over the air easily unless it's something like an Android system. Most Linux systems are monolithically secured, so they need to be updated as, as a block. On the There's a, a cost to all of these integrations. There's the physical cost of doing the integration. No one uses a constant, consistent API. Even though it might look logically similar, there's always work to do. Second thing is certification. Everything that gets deployed needs to be certified by the content provider. And this even goes with Android. If you, you take the advantage of having the Android API, you still have to certify with the provider to make sure it works to their satisfaction on that device. So everything comes with a cost whether it's the first integration, whether it's a later update, in which case you need to recertify the updated piece. So technically, when you think about the technical aspects of delivering apps to devices, can you give us a little color as to the different ways that can happen? Sure. Um, the vast majority of systems out there are Linux based. So assuming Linux, assuming POSIX and defining a system that is compatible with that or a client that's compatible with that, is is one of the major approaches taken. The strategy of integrating a streaming app is, is pretty uniform. Everyone understands the fundamental technology. However, the APIs are always different. Some people might assume that there's an underlying GStreamer infrastructure. Some people might assume that there's a, a, you know, a primitive direct path to decoders. So APIs vary and there is always work to do to interpret the, the individual API. Some APIs are push, some APIs are pull. It's, that's one of the challenges. The second is just the physical constraints of the device themselves. These are low cost devices. They have limited CPU, limited GPU, limited resources in terms of storage, etc. At some point with enough applications integrated on that device, you're going to start hitting a limit. You're also going to find scenarios where in background, when you finish using an app, if you throw it into background mode, so it can resume quickly the next time it's needed, you are not going to have the space and memory to be in background mode. So you'll start, you'll start hitting cases where you get kicked out of background mode and have to do a full from scratch boot simply because the user is cycling through applications and the device is not a big device. So if I'm an operator and, and I need to put 10, 15 apps out into the consumer base in order to manage my churn and, and become mainstream in the industry, what are the main things I need to be concerned with? What are the things I need to think about upfront? Yeah, you want to, if you're looking at these 10 to 15 apps, your primary concern is going to be the cost of integrating each one of those, which is going to be a cumulative cost, the cost of certifying each one of those. And then you're going to have to sit and look at things like, will they all fit on the device? That's a fairly simple one. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a sum. How big is this thing? The next thing you're going to be concerned about is what sort of agreements you might have with all of these content providers. So by that, I mean the notion of foreground and background. If you are not using an app, it goes into a background mode. 
so it can launch quickly. The order in which that operator engages with those partners is going to determine who has preference in the background queue. So if you come in at, at, at application number six or seven, you may never see that background queue. So you're going to be one of the first processes to be kicked out of the background queue when there's when there's a shortage of resources. So I mean, the obvious and ideal answer to a question like that is, well, well, don't. Just integrate one thing. And, and somehow let's find a way with that one thing to get all of those 10 apps. Mm -hmm. Now, if we've got 10 to 15 apps, and of course, uh, everyone wants to grow their app store, 30, 40 apps or more, how does how do you see the, the role of search and discovery uh, in that? Everyone needs to be able to promote their content. Uh, that's the only way they're making money, and it's the only way can, uh, operators are actually going to be uh, putting putting these these apps out there into the mainstream with their consumers. Right. Um, this is actually quite a nice thing about our solution, which which sort of struck me recently is if we look at a world where the customer has to go and install an app to see the content, where in order to discover content on that app, the search engine needs to know that the app is on the device, then you've got a cause and effect base. You've got a barrier to entry, right? You've got something that prevents normal search and discovery from simply pointing the customer to content. So in a scenario where the search and content indicates that not only is the content available, but the app is available as well without the need to install it. I mean, that that's a win. So the notion of search and discovery is pretty uniform. Some of the challenges are going to come with the fact that any given system is going to have multiple search and discovery engines into operating. Um, I don't think that that's not a particularly unique challenge. It just means that anything that we might do has to somehow be easily translatable to a centralized mechanism. But having the ability to not not have to install the app is, is really, really powerful. It means that search and discovery results in available content immediately. You don't have the step of search says, this isn't content, uh, this isn't application X. Let me go and see if I have application X in my app store. Oh, yes, I do. Let me install that. You can go all the way through. I think we've seen recently HBO announcing that you can look at the app without having a subscription. So you can see certain amount of free content. You can see promo content. So you can actually get right into the app. So I think that's critical that the app can be put in front of a customer without having to go through that manual step of getting it. So search and discovery allows you to get straight to the content and promotes the app itself. People will then buy into those those apps. Excellent. Well, Martin, thanks a lot for joining us today. And uh, we'll certainly be speaking with you again soon. Yeah, it was a pleasure being here. And thanks, everyone, for joining us for another edition of the Business of OTT. Uh, look forward to uh, being with you again.